Channel Marketers. Welcome to episode number 22 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. I'm Sarah Sinekroche. I'm the host here. And you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you are an entrepreneur who is fed up with the traditional marketing model, the hypey stuff, and you are ready for a paradigm shift. I describe myself on my about page as a hippie turned business coach and explain that I grew up in a hippie commune in the 80s. Of course, Tad Hargrave, who founded Marketing for Hippies, has been on my guest wish list for a long time. And it's mainly thanks to my friend Sean from WordPressForGood.com that I finally got to talk to him because Tad is a client of Sean's. So thank you, Sean, for the introduction. You'll actually hear us mention Sean and his rebrand during the show, so now you know the full story. We also talk about slow marketing, heart-centered copywriting, and a whole lot more. It's a slightly longer episode, but I think you'll really enjoy it. Before we get into it, let me tell you a bit more about Tad. Tad Hargrave is a hippie who developed a knack for marketing and then learned how to be a hippie again. Despite years in the nonprofit activist world, he finally had to admit he was a marketing nerd and, in the end, he became a marketing coach for hippies. Maybe it was because he couldn't stand seeing his hippie friends struggle to promote their amazing, green, and holistic projects. Maybe it was because he couldn't keep a 9-to-5 job to save his life. Whatever the reason, for almost a decade, he has been touring his marketing workshops around Canada, bringing refreshing and unorthodox ideas to conscious entrepreneurs and green businesses that help them grow their organizations and businesses without selling their souls. This all feels like a minor miracle as Tad spent his early marketing days learning and applying some very inauthentic, high-pressure, extremely gross and pushy marketing approaches. This has made him super allergic to these kinds of approaches because he discovered they made him feel slimy, even in personal friendships. He didn't sleep well, and he's very sorry to all those people he spoke with back in the day. After a decade of unlearning and unpacking that whole scene, he now feels ready and able to help other people find ways to market that feel wonderful. Tad currently lives in Edmonton, Alberta, and his website is marketingforhippies.com. I think you can see why I really had to speak to Tad. So without further ado, let's listen to Tad and me talk about slow marketing and heart-centered copy for conscious entrepreneurs. Hi, Tad. How are you today? I'm doing well, you? I'm good. Thank you. It's the end of my day. So I'm um, looking forward to just chilling. <laughs> I am so excited to have this conversation with you. Like I said in the unofficial part of our conversation just before recording, what appealed to me is two things. First of all, the hippie marketing. And then the second thing is, is just kind of like you talk a lot about um, making marketing fun, right? So I want to talk about these two things. And then the third thing I want to go into is the copywriting, because on your website, you talk about copywriting for heart-centered entrepreneurs. And that's where I want to go with our conversation. So first, why don't you tell me the hippie story? How did you come about positioning yourself as, you know, the guy behind marketing for hippies? Well, you know, I grew up, I went to a Waldorf school when I was a kid. So it was surrounded in that kind of hippie thing. But then I got into a lot of the Tony Robbins stuff and more of the mainstream personal growth, sales, capitalist rigmarole. And it was just not a very hippie thing. And <laughs> no. And then, but I did all this sales training and marketing training and, you know, some of it was good. Some of it I still use and refer to. And there was a lot of it that was very high pressure, pushy, manipulative. And I was 18 at the time when I got into this. So I just, I just drank that Kool-Aid and there were just a lot of consequences to it. Of I became a lot, I think less genuine. I got feedback from friends that I was pushy or plastic or, you know, 
So that that felt awful. And finally, I started coming across some resources of a different way to look at marketing or sales, which were so uh, liberating and freeing. And so then I started this business, which I, I mean, I didn't really, I called it radical business just because that was the name that came to me, but it didn't particularly have anything invested in that name. But when people would ask me, they'd say, what do you do? I said, I do marketing for hippies. And it was a joke. It was a throwaway <laughs> comment and they'd laugh. And then one day it occurred, I just thought, I wonder if that URL is available. And, and I checked and it was. And so I did that. So that's, that's the story. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. It, it's like whenever the hippie story comes up in dinner conversations, usually, yeah, first of all, there's this kind of awkward laughing, right? Because people just don't know what that really means. Or I noticed that when I'm uh, talking about that on podcasts in the U.S. specifically, I need to kind of specify that there's no drugs involved because apparently in the U.S., hippie is often attributed to a lot of drug use. So that's not what I understand from this hippie perspective. And I, I assume that you don't either. Like from your website, it also, there's a lot of green and not just because of your brand, but also kind of you know, making the world a better place and coming from that green uh, perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for you, hippie is also means like, you know, having those kind of values taking care of the world. Let's go to another conversation that I heard you talk on my friend Kat Nelligan's Creative Introvert podcast, and there you talked about slow marketing. And that's a, a term that really appeals to me. And yet I think there's a lot of resistance to this word. Anytime you say something slow, people are like, oh, but I don't want slow. I want fast. Why do you think there's so much? Well, first of all, tell us more about what you mean by that term and, and why do you think there's so much resistance? So, uh, you know, I suppose it's, it's in reference and a nod to the slow food movement. This idea of, you know, a kind of response to the fast food and why don't we sit together and eat together and, you know, turn off our phones and and just enjoy each other's company and not wolf it down. There's a real grab-and-go culture in terms of food. And uh, so a similar thing with, with marketing. You know, there's so much of this very quick, how do we get instant results in, in sales and marketing? And so it was, that's what it's, it's a response to. And yeah, of course there's resistance, you know, and it should be said, I mean, there's a season for different things. There's a season for quick and hustle. And, you know, I have a whole 30 day program that I do every January called the meantime, which is all about that. You know, how do you, how do you increase your cash flow quickly? So there's, there's a season for that, but that's, it's, um, that can't be most of it, but it's just cause it'll burn you out. And, you know, the resistance to it is people say, well, I need clients and I can't wait a few years. So this is part of the problem mm-hmm. is that people have set themselves up in a fairly desperate fashion in their business. But here's the reality. It just takes two, three, four years to get a business to a point where it's going to financially sustain you. It just takes that time. Every once in a while, you'll hear uh, stories of an exception to that. Great. But for the most part, it takes, it takes years to do this. And you know, why? Because you're developing a reputation. You're, you're becoming known for something. Most marketing is word of mouth at the end of the day. Most marketing is friends telling friends about things that they find and that there's just a process to it. Can you do things to speed it up? Of course, but it does just take time because yeah, fundamentally that's how it works. So it takes time to grow. Most of this growth will be happening via this kind of word of mouth. And it's really good to define what we mean by, because I think people could look at slow marketing and say, well, that doesn't work, but good to define what we mean by work. <laughs> I was talking with a client of mine who was in my mentorship program, he lives in Leeds in England. And he used to work for, also for Tony Robbins and he would do all these seminars and they'd bring in all these, you know, the day long events where there are five speakers on stage and they're all selling their stuff at the back of the room. And it's very easy to sit there If you're in a room, you know, there's probably maybe a thousand people in a room like this and you see all the people running to the back and you're doing the math on the numbers of this. Like, oh my God, this, that was a $10,000 package. And I just saw a hundred people run to the back of the room Mm -hmm. to set up and they must've just made it, you know. So throughout the day, you just start saying, wow, there was like a million dollars in business that got done this day. And you think, well, I didn't like the pitch. I thought it was a little aggressive. I thought it was a little schmarmy, but I could probably do it better. 
you know, so, I mean, I'll learn these techniques. Sure. So you sign up to learn how to do these things, but here's the thing you don't see, you know, cause I was talking with this fellow and he said, yeah, the next day, what happened after that seminar, of course, is people call for refunds because <laughs> they get home and their spouse says, you spent how much money on what? Whose money now? <laughs> <laughs> and so they call to get a refund to cancel. And what percentage you might ask? Uh, oh, 90%, like nine zero meaning almost everybody wow. called and asked for a refund. Why? Because they were um, manipulated into the sale. They were hyped up, all the, you know, um, kind of arousal that gets created emotionally. And then when they get home or they sleep on it, they realize, oh, this is an insane amount of money. So it was fast. Yes, it got very quick results. It seemed to work, but then there's the other side of it. And that's not uncommon in this industry. I think they, they probably just bank on that. And it just seems like a disrespectful approach to me because it wastes time. Yeah. Causes a lot of stress and anxiety. And then you, you have, of course, so 90% of people call and ask for a refund. But does that mean the 10% of the remain are in? And it's definitely a fit. I would, I would imagine no. I'd imagine there's a good half of them who uh, didn't ask for a refund just because they're too nice. Mm-hmm. They're too polite. They can't say no. They've got really terrible boundaries. So what are we doing? It just seems so crazy to me. But here's where most of the work happens. You know, why it takes all these years to grow a business is because so much of that time is actually about just getting clear, getting one's niche kind of sorted and finding ways to articulate it, finding ways to say it in a way that lands as as clear for people so that they're not confused because that's most businesses I see, especially for service providers you know, life coaches, holistic practitioners, it's so nebulous what they do. It's a kind of everything for everybody. So then it's hard for people to make a call. Oh, I'll look at it later. Or, you know, I'll think about it versus if it's really clear. You know, I help these kinds of people with this kind of problem. I do it in this way. Here's the offer. People tend to know. And that doesn't mean they buy right away, but internally they usually make a decision of whether they would buy if the time or the money were right. So I just think it has to be, ultimately, there's got to be this basis of slow marketing, which, you know, I could translate as relationship building. (laughs) I was going to say that, yeah. Education, fostering a kind of goodwill and trust. Because I just don't have any interest in convincing anyone. I don't see marketing as being about convincing people to work with me. You know, so I've got this mentorship program. It's 400 US a month. Uh, So that's not a small amount of money for most people. But I've never convinced anyone to join it because people just call me and I'll say, you know, I think this might be of interest. I'll send them the sales letter and then they just sign up or they don't. People often email me just saying, hey, I'd like to work with you. Because why? They've been following me for years. They've watched my videos for years or read the blog post for years. So there's all this trust. And then there's just a timing thing that happens. So it takes time to build that following. It takes time to build that kind of goodwill and and trust. But once it's there, boy, it gets a lot easier. You know, in the beginning, you're hustling and you put in like 10 units of effort and you get one unit of reward and it seems so unfair and it doesn't work. And, you know, you're going to go broke. But if you're strategic about it, you think about your niche, you think about hubs, you think about how to best do this, it it gets to be a one-to-one, you know, one unit of effort, one unit of reward. But if you keep working it over time, of course, it flips. You put in one unit of effort, 10 units of reward. I think it would say, I would say, well, first of all, there's so much in all of the things that you just share, but just to kind of comment on the last thing is I think it depends. Uh, Yes, you could end up with, you know, one unit in nine units out, except if you're not doing it right, then you just end up in this hamster wheel forever and ever. And then you have to keep on hustling. And I think that's what most of the traditional marketing aims, they want people to keep depending on having to do it over and over and over again. They don't want people to actually build a sustainable business, right? Uh, the, The traditional marketing is targeted towards hustlers and people who are doing fast decisions and and, and want to build a business fast. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know if I would say it's the sort of conscious intention, but it just seems to happen. It just I think seems to happen, of, yeah. This poverty of imagination where it's just, well, that's just how it has to be. You know, mm-hmm. I suppose if you've, if you've only been in terrible, abusive relationships, then you just think, well, that's how it is. 
if you've only ever known really poor health, you just may not know that there's something else possible. And so if you've only ever been in this corporate, high-pressure, fast-paced world of manipulative sales, it's understandable that you think, well, that's just, that's what it is. But the consequence of that is you turn a lot of people off. The consequence is you develop this reputation for being pushy and people go away and don't trust you. So then you have to find new people. So then you're stuck in the hustle. So I don't, I don't know if I would agree that that's what they want. I just think that's all they know there is to want. Yeah. Is I hope I get some new prospects and some new people in the pipeline because that's all they've seen. That's so true because the marketers like you, they're not the loudest people out there. You know, the ones that we see, the techniques that we learn as we learn about marketing are not from the gentle marketers, like I like to call them, like you and others, because they're just quietly running their business in a sustainable model. They're not out there shouting, look at how I built a six, seven figure business and using all these you know, techniques. And so that's why as the online entrepreneurs just starting out, we sure. only know of the other more pushy techniques, I think. Yeah. And one thing I would say, just to give a bit of mercy to some of these people, it's good to remember a lot of the, the six-figure, seven-figure stuff that, that might read as kind of hyped is coming from the United States of America. I mean, that's just generally true. Right. And it's good to remember they don't have health care there. Right. You know, this is a real thing for a lot of them. I mean, if you lived in the States, you'd want to have a six- or seven-figure income literally just to survive because they're one illness away from bankruptcy, a lot of them. So I, I've got a bit of compassion for the people in the States who, who do this. And I still think this other approach is more effective than the loud, garish, in your face, you know, uh, shocking claims, outrageous statements, neon light kind of market. Mm, yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I didn't think about that. That's definitely true that there's this scarcity kind of energy that's brought to it probably because of the kind of just this, you know, way that the, the healthcare works and, and just in general, how America is, is set up. I would say that despite all of this, there are signs that, you know, things are changing, that people are starting to be ready for uh, uh, this kind of more heart centered approach. You have been doing this for, you know, years and years do you see some kind of momentum building as well, or, or is it all just a big illusion? Well, sure, but I see momentum building on both sides. Mm. I mean, it's, so it's, 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 this is the time we're in it, and it's hard to know how to make sense of it. Or, and I don't know if it, it's served by any kind of big summary statement, but there's a lot that's unraveling in the world that we all see. I mean, just climate destabilization and ecosystem collapse loss of indigenous languages and cultures. And, and I mean, I could go on with the signs of the end times and they are, there are plenty. And, you know, you and I probably both see the, the other side of it too, is people drawn to a more human way of living and doing business and permaculture and local food and holistic healing and, and getting away from the conventional model of a lot of things. So it, it, it's all happening at the same time. And so I certainly see momentum on that side. I see more and more people kind of jumping ship from the dominant culture and thank God. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. There's definitely things are going faster and faster. And it seems like if you only look at the negative side, it seems like, oh my God, where are we going with this? It just gets worse and worse. But a paradigm shift only happens if it gets so bad that we just cannot go on the way it is anymore. Well, and maybe, I just say maybe there's nothing about things getting bad that equals a guaranteed paradigm shift. <laughs> you know, That's true. You know, um, one, one I'm not convinced happen. about that, <laughs> but I don't think the way things are right now, can, people are going to notice that something needs to change. And I see signs everywhere. They might be small signs, but I see more signs now than I saw 10 years ago. And so sure. that gives me hope. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, and I would just say the, um, some people will change. I mean, we, we could all name lots of people in situations where it got real bad and then people just, th then it was over and there was no re particular redemption in that moment or that generation. 
So it can be um, too late sometimes. And, and that's, that's a good thing to know. But it's to me, that's just all the more reason for, for all of us to be doing the work that we're, we're doing. Because part of the reason that things get very bad and there's a lot of pain and suffering, but they don't change is they don't, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, they don't see an alternative. Mm-hmm. And so they keep doing the same thing. They look around, you know, they work a corporate job that they hate. And they think, boy, I should really get out of this. But then they look around and, you know, and I've I said this for years in my workshops. I said, look, if they look at us, as the alternative, and we're just a bunch of broke hippies struggling and miserable. They just stay. Right. Why would you leave the safety net of the corporate world? So it, it just means it's very important that we find a way to make it work, what we're doing, because it has this unintended but very real consequence of either inspiring people towards this or warning them away from it. Right. Yeah. I think you're right that sometimes it's too late for a specific generation. But usually what happens is the next generation, they look at our generation and go, are you guys crazy? Why would you do things that way? And then they want to do things differently. And you're also right. But yes, we need to show them that there is a different way and that that way is working. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And with the caveat of what you just said, of if there's anyone left in the generation. <laughs> Yes, yes. Let's go from that dark topic to another topic which brings in that heart-centered copywriting. Because when we make that switch from uh, just basically putting ads out there yeah. to a more heart-centered approach where we you know, bring in stories and, and all of that, Usually, at least I know that happened to me after wearing this marketing mask for so many years and being trained with the traditional marketing model, then having to come from this other perspective to bring in stories, my brain just couldn't go there for a long time. It's like it was stuck in the wrong side of the brain. So kind of if you could take our listeners to some tips that you have around heart-centered copywriting. And and maybe we can talk about a specific example, like a sales page, right? If you think about a a traditional sales page and now say, okay, how would I change that into a more heart-centered sales page? Okay. You know, so this is an interesting thing. I mean, at some point I'll probably write some kind of book about copywriting and my thoughts on it. Yeah. But it's got to be said that, I mean, heart-centered and, I don't know, love-based, spiritual, all these terms have been used and, and frankly, overused in the, in the marketing world. And there's nothing about just using those terms that confers upon one freedom from all the, the contrivances and manipulation and that's in traditional marketing. I've seen stuff that where they talk about it. This is heart-centered business. And then I look at the sales page and I I don't see it. Right. I just see the same thing. But it's it's even worse now because they use a language that might have you feel a little more vulnerable and open up to them. And then they manipulate you just the same. I've seen this and I've heard about it in workshops and people come to these. It's ostensibly conscious, but they leave feeling more violated because of it. So that's got to be said. And I've read stuff that, you know, there's a fellow, Jay Abraham, you may know. Uh, he's you know, one of the marketing gurus of the marketing gurus. And frankly, I like his sales letters better than most of the conscious heart-centered business. And he's just diehard capitalist. Mm-hmm. I mean, overtly, explicitly. So, mm-hmm. But it's because there's no guile in what he does. There's nothing. He's just so overt about his intentions. Like, look, here, I'm going to make this offer. Here's why I'm making the offer, because I hope by giving you this free stuff, it will sufficiently charm you and impress you that you'd want to buy from me. And, and so he just lays it all out on the table. His sales letters are very long, and yet they're very effective and they work really well. I think because he's so candid, because he's so honest in his, his approach. Okay, so with those two things having been said, well, here's the other kind of preamble to get to the eventual amble on copywriting is the writing, it's people, I think maybe look at like there's a skill you're going to learn that's going to handle everything. You know, you're going to learn these techniques of copywriting. And sure, there's a lot of things like try not to have paragraphs more than five lines long, use short sentences, write at a grade 
seven kind of age 12 language, you know. But that's exactly why I told you that's why my brain couldn't do the switch, right? Because that's where I was coming from. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? Just tell stories? Like, how does that work? Where is the, the guidelines? Where is the templates, right? Yeah, I can give you a template. I mean, if you go to marketingfreebies.com slash sales letter, sales letters, there's a 16 point outline of a general sales letter. So we'll link to that. Yeah. So you can have that, but the challenge is that's not the foundation of it. The foundation of it, there's a few things. One is having your niche clear Mm -hmm. because what you've got to start with in a sales letter, whether it's a headline or just a first sentence or image is the relevance piece, you know, generally, and I got this from a colleague of mine in Seattle, Dominic Canterbury, talked about these three things, relevance, credibility, value. So generally, there's your sales letter. Right. You start with relevance of just, is this a fit for me generally? You go to credibility, building the trust that, yes, this I can do what I'm saying I can do, or I can make the product I say I can make. And then third, the value. Here's the offer. So there's your general three-point outline. So you've got to start with the relevance. And most people don't. You know, most people, their headlines are just so appallingly bad. So I'll just give one example. This is on my website under free stuff, case studies. But in Guelph, Ontario, there was a uh, spin farming company. Spin farming stands for small plot intensive farming. And basically, they'll lease out your backyard and grow food in it and then sell it at farmer's markets or at a high-end restaurant. Some people make good money doing this. Hmm. But their uh, brochure, it it's, had the, first of all, their logo on top. Nobody cares about your logo. It's not relevant <laughs> to me. I don't care. I know you spend a lot of money. I don't care. So they start with that. So it's not relevant. And then it said backyard bounty is a micro farming venture. So now you've done in five words, you've just, uh, number one, you start with your name, backyard bounty. I don't care right. about your name. I care about my name. I care about um, you naming me to see if this is a fit. And then is a micro farming venture. The hell is micro farming? Just tweezers, just a tiny little, <laughs> you know, so you've confused me now. Yeah. So, you know, in an image in five words, nothing has worked for me as the person reading it. So we changed it and we said, attention Guelph homeowners, big headline. Do you have a backyard you're not using? How your backyard is smaller, how your backyard can make you the envy of your neighbors, a hero to your local community, provide local green jobs, and maybe even make you a little bit of money without you ever lifting a finger, something like that. Wow. So you see what I'm saying? We haven't talked about what it is, but the relevance is there. Right. And the primary relevance, frankly, is in the, do you have a backyard you're not using? Right. That's the main thing. So, or with our, our mutual friend, Sean, from uh, wordpressforgood.com. So he was sitting here in my living room. He was sitting right, <laughs> right there. Okay. Right there. But so he helps for context for people. He helps people with WordPress websites where, you know, there's problems where your website slows down. And mine was in really rough shape. It was getting slower. Some of my friends commented on it and it had been hacked three times. And thank God I had it backed up because I would have lost 700 blog posts and just, oh, wow. you know, it would have been one of those things like, I'm just going to start something new because I can't bear starting over. So he joined my mentorship program and then he, uh, I saw what he did and I just immediately signed up because I, I need this. And anyway, so he came, we were trying to figure out the niche thing for him. Right. Because in the context of copywriting, the niche again, will be the very first thing you say. And so we're trying to figure out basically what's the headline for his homepage. Right. People get, because they're going to get, and you've got about three seconds. They hit the website, they look around. What the hell is this? I don't understand. They're gone. And we sat there and we thought, well, maybe it could be, I mean, is it holistic practitioners? Is it crafters? Is it business to business? And we were just going in circles. And finally, I sat back and I looked at him and I said, oh man, it's too obvious. You're the, 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 the deal breaker. And this is a good thing to think about in terms of relevance. Like what's the basic, this is the, the one thing. I said, it's, it's people who have a website, a WordPress website, first of all, obviously, but who utterly rely on it for their business. Because you and I both know people that if their website went down, you, know, you might see them and say, hey, Barry, is your website still down? Yeah, it's been down for three months. What are you going to do? And they don't care particularly. Their business is still working. It's not really a problem. But then there are businesses you and I both know, if the website went down, this would become an immediate crisis within an hour. So for example, they have a yoga studio and people book for classes and things through the website or they uh, sell crafts online and that people buy it or they have um, like an online community. Right. Yeah. Any kind of online business basically relies on their website. Yeah. And so 
that was the thing. So that, and that became the headline. So it, when I, you know, it seems like nothing, but that ability to just name the thing when somebody would read it, because what you want in the very first thing is for people to say, Oh, that's me. Right. Yeah. No, the minute he changed, like we've known each other for quite a while and he was always the WordPress. I can't remember what his brand was before, but it was always the WordPress guy. And I'm like, yeah, he's a nice guy. But the minute he, like I saw his, I don't even know. Him. Oh no. I was actually working with a client who was a B Corp label. Okay. So, yeah. you know, business for good. Right. And I was like, oh, wait, I think I know someone who does WordPress because he, he was looking for a WordPress kind of maintenance guy. And then I saw that he just recently rebranded yeah. to WordPress for good. I'm like, oh, my God, this is a match make in heaven. And immediately, yeah, I'm like, well, and that's kind of what I'm doing with, with my marketing as well in, in the Gentle Marketing Revolution program. It's, yes, you need to know your niche and what he's doing as well with WordPress for Good is bringing in his own values. Yes. This is Sean. This is what Sean stands for. He leads with his values. He wants people who want to do business for good. He doesn't yeah. want just only people who have a WordPress website and an online business. He wants right. people who care about making the world a better place. And so everything you said Yes, totally. And you probably were going to add that eventually. But yes, also bring in your values, bring in what you stand for, bring in, you know, your stories as well. So I think that really is all the things that need to go on a, on a sales page that is heart centered or whatever you want to call it. Well, and let me let me come at this also from another angle too, is the purpose of copywriting in my mind is that, well, there, okay, so three roles of marketing. First role of marketing is it has to get their attention. Right. Second role of marketing is it's got to filter. Third, it's got to lower the risk. So this could be another way of looking at a sales letter. So getting their attention, well, that's the headline. That's the thing that has them look, oh, oh this is for me. This isn't just a generic something for everybody. This is, right. Uh, so that's number one. Then it's got to filter. And this is so important. So to me, the very first thing in, in Sean's website was, um, and said the website was wpstrands.com. And I had the same thing. Right. I literally never remember it because it didn't make any sense. It was just, it, I just couldn't remember. So that's not good from, from a marketing standpoint. But WordPress for good, it's so easy to remember. Yeah. That's it for word of mouth. That's a helpful tip. You know, uh, when I changed it from tadhargrave.com, which is or radical business, because people couldn't remember it necessarily to uh, marketing for hippies, easy to remember. So pro tip. Right. Um, but yeah, so filtering. So I, I knew the first thing was, okay, that a WordPress website they rely on. But then later in the sales letter, I said, let's talk about this now. Let's talk about the values and who you want to work with. So to me, that what a sales letter should be doing is, is like a funnel, you know, the broad at the beginning. But even initially, it just knocks out 90% of the people. Mm -hmm. There's a huge drop off or like a Nautilus shell, you know, goes around. It gets narrow pretty quick. So the very first thing on the, on the website should eliminate most people. And as people are reading, they should be dropping off if right. they're not a bit. That's the goal. So that by the end of the sales, the only people who are there are people who are really a fit. You know, and so one of the ways you can do this is just consider on the sales are adding, this is designed for people who bah, 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 and be very specific, not general, not, it's very easy to get into that, who are really willing to take responsibility for their lives, who want to do the work, who are like, and it's, it's too broad. You get real specific. A great example of this, somebody in my mentorship program, uh, Kalita, she has a website, showgirlawakening.com. She uses burlesque dance as a women's empowerment. It's amazing work. And she does a great job of filtering. And just mm -hmm. like if you're into these things, if you're right. drawn to this and this, we could be a fit. But also it can be helpful to add that thing of we're probably not a fit if, bah. Mm -hmm. be real specific about that. Um, it, I often say with copywriting, this is my little other pro tip. Consider this. Once you've done your, your sales letter, you can't think of anything else to add. Here's the thing to add. Go through it again and ask yourself, how could I make this more repulsive to the people I don't want to work with? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's helpful. You one or two things. You can, I'll add this. And, and then the people who I, I really have not enjoyed working with, they would run. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's helpful. But, and then, of course, stories. But I'll say this. You know, stories, case studies, is very helpful. But why are we sharing the stories or case studies and what is the point of a sales letter or i mean we could translate this to an intro workshop because the same thing the point of it is we're not trying to make the case 
primarily for them to hire us, work with us, buy our products. What we're trying to do is make the case for a certain perspective or philosophy. What I'm saying when I write a sales letter, which is why sometimes they need to be very long, is I'm saying, look, okay, as you can see in the headline, you're here because you're struggling with this kind of problem. Or you want this particular kind of product you're really drawn to. But let's talk about for a service provider. You're struggling with this problem. You want this kind of result. Let me make the case, because maybe you work with me, maybe you don't. There's a lot of reasons it may be a fit or not. So let me make the case for the approach that I would take to it. Mm -hmm. So that whether you work with me or not, hopefully you've got some guidance and support. So the sales that are actually can play this immensely educational kind of teaching function that can be really profound. Uh, and people can leave the sales that are having learned a lot. This mm -hmm. was the thing I really got from Jay Abraham because he does that so well. But it, I realized it was years, I mean, this 20 years later, I realized, oh man, I don't even know if he realizes or he would have said it this way. But what he was doing was making the case for an approach, a philosophy, a perspective, an understanding, a cosmology around this issue. So one woman I worked with in a one-on-one -on -one session, she, she came to me and she, she does uh, Ayurvedic nutrition, but she was really struggling around the niche thing. And she said, well, I have some ideas. And they were all terrible because it was just so, it didn't make any sense. She said, I would say I could do with, with female entrepreneurs. But I said, so, but why? I don't get how the Ayurvedic nutrition, like what's the fit there? It, it, mm -hmm. It's not immediately obvious, so it's not helpful. But finally, I asked her a good question to ask oneself. I said, what got you into, why are you doing Ayurvedic nutrition? And she said, because well, I well, fibromyalgia, I had real bad and it's just crippling. I couldn't, you know, do anything. I tried all the things, nothing worked. Finally, this is the thing that saved me and I have no symptoms now. And I was just like, well, that's your thing. <laughs> there's, there's, at least, this could be a thing at least to roll with for a while. Right. And, you know, as it often is, she's too close to it. Yeah. She couldn't see it. And so you understand that then that if she had a sales letter, she'd be making the case for Ayurveda as an approach to fibromyalgia and really saying, look, here's what I think fibromyalgia is. Here's what it's not. Here's how it works in the body. And therefore, this is why this approach works so well. And you can get into the science of it, the metaphysics of it, the whole emotional, spiritual, social side of it. Because what I think we want is at the end of the sales that are even, because maybe somebody gets to the end and they can't afford it or the timing doesn't work, whatever. But at the end, they know genuinely if it's a fit and they have an immense trust in the approach that we're bringing. Because here's what happens. Let's say it's an intro workshop to shift context, which is the same thing. When people come in, they're kind of sitting upright. They're just sort of, well, maybe they're leaning in a bit because they heard good things about you. Maybe they're leaning out because somebody dragged them to the damn thing. But they're just neutral fundamentally. They're like, Hopefully. let's see what he's yeah. got. <laughs> which is, that's proper. That's a, that's a good approach to have. To yeah. Say. So by the end of it, if you've done your job, they're either leaning in really hard or leaning out really hard. Mm -hmm. And this is what's interesting to me. If they're leaning in, because let's say somebody with fibromyalgia goes and they sit through it and they think, oh my God, this makes more sense than anything I've ever heard or read on the subject. I'm so impressed. And then she gets to the pitch. Now this is where everyone puts all their energy in marketing. They teach you how to pitch well and like as if that's the whole thing. But she could do the worst pitch in the world. She could say, so anyways, um, thanks for coming if you want to work with me, but you probably don't. You probably really tell me why would you? A lot of people to work with, hit Google. Anyways, thanks for coming. See, it could be that bad. Basically, no pitch at all. But if you were leaning in real hard, you probably still go up to her at the end and say, we got to work on your self-esteem as starters. But do you work with people? I wasn't clear if you actually work with people. <laughs> like you might fight through the strange shame and awkwardness around pitching, but if they're leaning out, if they're thinking like, I have never heard worse drivel in my life. And then you do the best pitch you've anyone's ever seen. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good the pitch is. Mm -hmm. If the relevance isn't there and the credibility isn't there, it doesn't matter how valuable it is. It's those three in that order, relevance, credibility, value. And when those first two are gone, are missing, yeah. utterly irrelevant how smooth your pitch is yeah and again i would add in the values or the worldview which you so well explain right it's like at the end of the page maybe i'm not ready right now but i've just really realized that this person has the same kind of worldview as me and maybe i don't need this course right now but when this person you know comes up with something else I'll be the first one to buy because I just know that this is the person I need to work with. 
Yeah, I, I remember years ago, I got a, a sales letter from this fellow, Randy Gage, who's a direct marketing guy. He had a five-day training coming up. And he said, um, you know, he explained, it seemed like a good thing. He said, but you should know I'm a fundamentalist Christian and there will be worship at this event. And I just thought, God bless you, Randy Cage. <laughs> Not good for me. But could you imagine if you're a fundamentalist Christian yeah. trying to build a business? And I, then you you're my guy. Yeah. So it's, yes, I mean, all this. Um, and uh, here's what I would say. And, I, and maybe we'll agree on this. Maybe we'll disagree. Because <laughs> there's, there's two propositions we're making all the time in business. One is the value proposition. One is the values proposition. Right. The value proposition is the return on investment. You give me this much money. Here's what you get in return. Right. Values proposition is, and here's the ethics and principles behind how and why I do it. The most important is the value proposition in terms of if they're going to buy. Because you can have great values. And this is the thing, you know, every, every city has that eco store, holistic, you know, they're trying to do something good in their community and they are silently going broke. Because here's what happens. Everyone says, I really support you. What a great store but they don't spend the money there. Mm -hmm. often, you know? So the values are not enough. Mm -hmm. The values will get you a uh, stature in the community. They will have you respected and admired for all the good things you do, but it has to solve a problem for people. There has to be value there. Yeah. And because I remember when, you know, the phosphate free detergents came out in the eighties, they were terrible. They just stained your clothes. It didn't <laughs> work. They didn't do the job right. that they, said they were going to do. And so people stopped using them fundamentally, except the hardcore granolas. Well, it doesn't look that bad. Yes, it looks terrible. So it's good to, to balance these things. And if you can have a very clear value proposition and then add the values proposition, I mean, this is often a, what pushes it over the edge for people to buy. It creates a kind of resonance and deep trust. They become a lot more patient with us when we screw up because of the values. They are willing to spend more money there's a whole thing called the LOHAS, the Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability that came out you know, 20 years ago. And I don't know if they still do it, but they, they made this case. There's a whole market and you can Google it. And that's real uh, great to work with, but it, it hinges on the values piece. Yeah, no, I so agree with that. Yes, values are, I think, important, especially going forward. Uh, you see the companies that do marketing well going forward are the ones that lead with values. But clearly, if there's no value in what they're offering, then, then it's just an empty shell, yeah. right? So eventually, that will not be a sustainable business either. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I, I just think, yeah, very helpful to have both. And, and it's, it's got to be sincere because if, if it's not, eventually it's very likely that truth will come out yeah. that it's a cynical kind of greenwashing we've heard about or local washing or good washing. And, and that's, that's, um, Oh man, they turn on you so fast. The yeah, it's kind of like this abuse of vulnerability and authenticity that you mentioned previously. Eventually people are too smart nowadays. Consumers are too empowered with access to the internet and everything else that eventually it won't come out. So I totally yeah. agree with that. Well, I think we've given listeners really, obviously not the step-by-step -step because that's not what, that's, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to create templates because at least for me, the different way of, of marketing is not the cookie cutter approach. Oh, here are the you know, seven steps on, on how to build your sales page. But it's more like big picture. And, and so you really did that well. And, and yes, there were some things that need to be included, but, but uh, you can't just go over to you know, your sales page and copy it because obviously it will be different for everyone else's business. So I think that's really key to remember. So I had a really great conversation. Thank you so much, Tad, uh, even though we didn't agree on everything, but I think a lot of things we agreed on. So very grateful for the time with you. Thank you so much. Most people will probably remember the domain name, marketingforhippies.com, and we'll make sure to add uh, the specific links in the show notes anywhere else that you want people to connect with you. Yeah, if people are struggling with niching, I've got a website, nichingspiral.com, and there's a home study that can help people with this. It's, I mean, whether whether for me or somebody else, this niche thing is so important because 
everything follows on it. Everything, you know, when people struggle, so why is marketing so hard and so complicated 99% of the time? It's, it's the niche is fuzzy. Mm-hmm. And that feels complicated. So there's that. And then, you know, on Facebook, I'm there. So cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. Thanks so much for your time, Todd. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find the show notes at sarasanacroce.com GBR22. And tune again in next week uh, where I'll talk about the P of partnerships. And this time I'm musing about coaches and mentors. The only thing I would do differently if I had to start over again was working with a coach earlier on. I hope you'll join me on this journey to a kinder marketing paradigm. And please invite your friends to join us by sharing this podcast, this specific episode, or the Gentle Business Manifesto with them. Both can be found at thegentlebusinessrevolution.com. Remember, there's no opt-in for the manifesto, so it's really just an invitation to download it and read it and see if it resonates. And of course, a review on iTunes, if that's where you're listening the podcast on, would really make my day. Thank you so much. Let's be the change we want to see in the world.